Most of you know me as the Executive Director of, of Recovering from Religion. We're a global nonprofit that seeks to provide hope, healing, and support to those folks who are struggling with doubt and non-belief. We are tabling here, and I hope you'll stop by the table and see the opportunities for, us, for you to join our awesome volunteer team if you're interested in doing that. But today, I'm going to talk about something a little different. I'm going to talk about my experience running for state senate in a little rural five-county district just south of Nashville in 2018. I promise it's a whole lot more interesting than that sentence led you to believe. I ran for this office in 2016 and got the same 35% as every other Democrat in the state of Tennessee. In 2018, it became an open seat in a special election cycle. And those of you who know politics knows, know what that means. And that improves your odds because you're not running against an incumbent. So I met with my family and loved ones and we started having a conversation about whether or not it would be a good opportunity to run. And so this is a good time for a disclaimer. The both recovering from religion and American atheists are nonprofit. The political views I'm going to share with you belong to me alone. I met with my dear friend who had become my campaign manager, and we discussed the opportunity to run. And we agreed that yes, it was the time to do that, provided we could run a campaign on transparency, dignity, ethics, and respect. Respect for the voters respect for the opponent, and respect for the process. We have had a Republican supermajority in, in Tennessee for 10 years, and our hands were going to be full just dealing with the issues that faced ordinary Tennesseans, health care, education, infrastructure. Real quick, I'm going to rattle off a few statistics about, about Tennessee. So you listen quickly, and I'll talk quickly. We are the 10th highest poverty in the country. We have the eighth shortest lifespan. We're number 42 on the comprehensive quality of life ranking. We're 15th from the bottom in education, ninth from the bottom in per student spending, and we're the third highest prescriber of opioids in all 50 states. We lost more people in 2017 to the opioid epidemic in Tennessee than we did in auto accidents across the state. Republican supermajority, 10 years. Now, I know what I'm asking you to do. I know you've seen enough campaign videos to last you a lifetime. If you'll give me these 60 seconds, it will tell you more about the kind of campaign we were gonna run than anything I can say. I've been a Rutherford County resident most of my adult life. I raised my four children on the hard work and fresh air of farm life, and they're all Tennessee public school graduates. I was a stay-at-home mom until my kids began to leave for college when I returned to my long-held dream of attending law school, and I became a lawyer in 2015. When I'm asked how I would govern, I have a simple three-question test. Is it rational? Does this legislation solve an identified problem in the state of Tennessee? Is it reasonable? Does this legislation make the very best use of your tax dollars and mine? And is it right? Does this legislation do the most good for the largest number of people with the least negative impact for the fewest number of people? My vision for District 14 provides health care for the working folks who need it while saving our rural hospitals, compensating our teachers with higher wages and tangible benefits while eliminating unnecessary student testing, and addressing our opioid addiction problem by destigmatizing treatment, holding the pharmaceutical industry accountable, and legalizing cannabis. My name is Gail, and I'm asking for your vote on March 13th in the special election for District 14. just showed this to you so you could see how vanilla and how normal and how very democratic issues this platform was. It was not radical. It was not scary. There was nothing in here. Even the, even the pro-cannabis position that I had um, is, is no longer radical anymore. We know the importance of that, particularly in states that are afflicted by the opioid crisis. So that was as, that was as boring as that little clip was. And when it was released, all hell broke loose. But there's one more piece of the story that you need to know for that to make sense, for why the Republicans lost their mind. I've been an out loud and proud atheist in my community for 10 years. Uh, yeah. So 
So yeah, that, that's an important thing to know when you know why the Republicans lost their mind. For example, this guy thinks I'm the, the title of my talk, thinks I'm one of the most dangerous women he's seen in all of his 40 years of politics. This guy is the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Tennessee. <laughs> the Chairman of the Tennessee Republican Party issued a statement to our Democratic U.S. Senate candidate and our Democratic gubernatorial candidate urging them to disclaim me from the party because of my radical views. Both of them declined to do that, fortunately. However, in spite of all the gloom and doom and the dramatic statements, we, can, we started to build in popularity. Volunteers streamed into our county offices ready to make phone calls, knock doors, and donations began to roll in. Uh, show of hands of everyone who's ever worked on a campaign, whether paid or volunteer or whatever, of course, because this is American Atheist, of course you have, so you'll recognize this. This is what's known as print media, and you would think in our digital age that this has become archaic, but no. It's still used, it's mailers, it's the glossy big mailers that you see. Um, these things are crazy expensive to have them printed and reproduced and mailed. Um, they cost about a dollar per voting household. And as we started climbing in popularity through our grassroots effort, the Tennessee Republican Party got busy with their flyers. And credit where credit is due. Congratulations to the GOP bro who combined the crazy tinfoil hat with the pussy hat. Very, very edgy move, bro. Um, notice, too, that the kooky liberal ideas that they credit me with are pro-education, pro-infrastructure, pro-cannabis, pro-choice. And yet, as these flyers continue to come, we continue to build more supporters, more voters registered, more volunteers. Keep in mind, every time you see one of these flyers pop up, $50,000 a piece, because he would send them, my opponent would send them to the 50,000 households in the district at one time. Now, I need to say something about the next two slides. I'm not terribly proud of them, but I'm not ashamed enough to take them out of my talk. If you're going to run for office and you're going to spend $50,000 to send 50,000 flyers to 50,000 households, do you think you could proofread them? <laughs> no? Is that just me? And if you're going to spend the 50,000, to send the 50,000 flyers to 50,000 households, and you misspell the state you're running to hold office, you are automatically disqualified. Can I get an amen? amen. And in spite of the ugliness and the bigotry, we continued to climb. More voters registered, more volunteers coming in and knocking on doors, making phone calls, more momentum for the campaign. Because this is a, was a special election, it was a compressed cycle. Those of you who are involved in politics knows what that is. Instead of a two-year or an 18-month cycle, we were, we were limited to 12 weeks. So we ran what's known in, in the in political world as a get out the vote campaign. We were notifying our voters. We didn't have time for the alternative theory, which is the persuasion campaign, particularly with our circumstances. So <clears throat> in trying to contact all of our Democratic voters, we sent a postcard to every single Democratic voting household, one postcard three times over the course of the 12 weeks. Now, if you're doing the math in your head and you heard me say that it's $50,000, and by the way, our, our goal for fundraising for our campaign was $50,000 altogether, which we proudly met. So how did we do this? Every postcard was bought, written, addressed, stamped, and mailed by volunteers. Is anybody in here written for, or heard of the organization or written postcards for postcards to voters? Yes, a few of you have. It's a grassroots effort to, for progressive candidates to try to defray some of that expensive cost of sending those. So all of these flyers that they're sending at 50,000 apiece, ours came in at a cost of zero to our campaign. Republican flyers kept coming. And we continued to build. And then this happened. Now this takes a little bit of a backstory. In December of 2017, before my election in March of 2018, I had the joy and the privilege of marrying two dear friends. 
In celebrating that day, and of course with their permission, I posted on my public Facebook page a picture of the joyous event, and with classic Jordan Snark, my status was doing my part to destroy the fabric of America. <laughs> because I'm funny. Just invite me to your parties. So the Tennessee GOP lifted the image and the status, put it on a flyer, reproduced it, mailed it to the 50,000 households. What they didn't realize is that these two gentlemen are constituents in the district. What they also didn't realize is one of these gentlemen is an Air Force veteran, diagnosed, it won't surprise you, with combat-related PTSD. So picture, if you will, a sunny March morning in 2018, and this honorable soldier walks to his mailbox, pulls out a flyer, and there's a picture of the happiest day of his life being mocked by the Tennessee Republican Party sent to thousands. I will say that Shane and Landon, my friends, have pursued legal action against the Tennessee GOP, and in the interest of their privacy, that's all I'll say about it, except to say they're a big part of the free-thinking community in the Middle Tennessee area, so they'll watch this on video, so let me say, Shane, thank you for your service to our country, and Shane and Landon, thank you for involuntarily sacrificing your privacy on the altar of bigotry of Tennessee. And yet, still we continue to climb. More volunteers, more door knocks, more calls, more donations, more endorsements, teachers, union members, senior adults, students, homemakers. The primary had come and gone. I had had no opponent, but my Republican had, and the voter turnout on their side was dismal for the primary. It's always low in a special election, but this was exceedingly low. Between our momentum and between the fact that the flyers didn't seem to be having the impact that they wanted it to have, and then the low voter turnout, my opponent's campaign then made a decision to engage in unethical and unconstitutional behavior. I'm not gonna make you strain your eyes to read this whole thing, but let me just read the first five words. Good afternoon, pastors and friends. This letter is from my opponent's campaign manager. It goes on to tell about this special election that's coming up, and it describes me as the baby-eating, goat-sacrificing, Satan-worshipping heathen that I am. <laughs> and then, he, of course, there's the obligatory paragraph about his how much he loves baby Jesus credentials. And then we get to the money shot. First Amendment much? Say the first part with me if you can. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Show of hands for everyone for whom this is the first American Atheist Convention. Oh, sweet. Oh, look at that. That's wonderful. Well, welcome. I hope you're having a great convention. It gives me a great amount of pride to stand here and say that when you begin to approach the wall of separation between church and state, you're going to get attention from both sides. Same day I got this tweet. I got tweeted by this, what's the word I'm looking for? Person? And it didn't stop there. We had a piece on NPR. We were featured in USA Today. It just went on and on. Then came the day when the entire time-space continuum was torn asunder. Remember I mentioned that my Republican opponent had had a primary. His, his primary opponent, his Republican primary opponent, was a Tea Party guy, even more hard right, even more Republican than he was. And because my opponent had run just as down and dirty and disgusting a campaign against him as he did against me, this happened. I was endorsed by the Tennessee Tea Party. The Tennessee Tea Party endorsed the liberal, atheist, activist, democratic woman. What is even happening right now?
We had resisted in the face of all of that bigotry. We rallied against the ugliness, the fearful and hateful rhetoric, the attack on religious liberty, the mocking of an honorable soldier, time and effort and money and passion pushed back against the status quo. We fought and resisted and stayed true to our ethics and not one time did we violate our campaign promise to run a moral, clean, issue-based campaign. But the letter to the pastors had found its mark. And if you don't think that the dozens of churches and the dozens of pastors to whom this letter was sent didn't immediately turn around and comply and begin to preach this message of fear and divisiveness and politics, well, I beg your pardon, but you don't know Tennessee and you don't know religion. I want you to take a look around you. This is American Atheists. The demographic of the non-religious is the fastest growing demographic in the country as well as in Tennessee. We are young and diverse. The church-going demographic is the opposite. They're older and whiter. So to drill down to what really happened here, this Republican candidate targeted this group of older white voters, enlisted the pastors to spread his message of the heathens are coming, this group of senior adults, terrified, went out and voted just as he intended, and then retreated back into their homes, locked their doors, more angry, more fearful, and more isolated than they were before. And their children don't have health care, and their grandchildren don't have broadband in the rural areas. Their neighbors don't have relief from the opioid issue with, via cannabis and their local hospital or hospitals are closed because they can't stay open without reimbursement. Do you know what the expression rubbing salt in the wound is <laughs> or adding insult to injury? Not long after he was elected, my opponent was named chaplain of the Senate because of course Tennessee has a Tennessee Senate chaplain. And in the proclamation, you know I'm gonna say it, in the proclamation, one of the reasons for the appointment was his strong defense of religious liberty. So, I'm not bitter, <laughs> not at all. This is my not bitter face. <laughs> but the results of the election are not the end of the story, not by a long shot. But what do we do here? Quit? Not run? Keep our beliefs a secret? Here are some of the takeaways that I've identified from my experience. Number one, in March of 2018, thousands of Tennessee Democratic Christian voters voted for an out and open atheist. This is Tennessee, where even our Democrats are moderate, you know that. And they not only voted, they supported financially, they campaigned for, they knocked doors, and they were visible supporters, presumably at the risk of their social status and their family relationships. Number two, we were able at, to add to the conversation at the local, state, and national level about atheists running for office. We need more of those conversations. The results may be binary, but there are things that happen in addition to the results that matter, and we have to stop thinking about these elections in terms of only the seat. Number three, how many times as non-believers are we faced with the straw man of how can you be moral without religion? Because the Tennessee Republican Party elected to elevate my atheism as an issue. In every newspaper interview, in every podcast, in every radio interview, in every appearance, I got the opportunity, the privilege of being able to explain what it means to be a humanist. I got to say over and over and over my story that both my campaign and my life are based on equal parts reason and compassion. What moves me to act is my neighbor's well-being, their real suffering, and their real joy. My goal is to increase the joy and decrease the suffering.
One of the greatest joys of the campaign when I was out in the district was meeting non-believers. There was not a public event we had when afterwards, when people are gathered around and they want to shake your hand and I could see it coming, someone would hover t toward the back and when they finally got to me and shook my hand, they would lean in. I'm not a believer, but I can't be out. I'm not a believer, but I haven't told my parents yet. Thank you for running for what we believe in. It was one event where we had a young mother. She brought her two little girls, school-age girls, one in each hand. She's raising these girls to be free thinkers, and she wanted them to shake the hand and take a picture of what it means to be an out and open free thinker and a leader. And the last one, and maybe the most important, a trail was blazed. The seal was broken. Never again can Tennessee say, this is the first time an open atheist has run for office in Tennessee. Because I have a farm and, and I know what this image is, what sticks with me is the idea of laying down the grass for the people who come behind us. Never again can they say that an atheist, this is the first time an atheist has run for office, but what they can say, and maybe even about somebody in this room, is that this is the first time an atheist has run for office in Tennessee and won. So we circle all the way back to the beginning. Am I the most dangerous woman in Tennessee? It won't surprise you that my answer is a very lawyerly, it depends. <laughs> it depends upon what you're afraid of. If you're afraid of a woman who will stand before hundreds and call out your bigoted and unconstitutional behavior, if you're afraid of a woman who will give a voice to those without a voice, who will stand with the underserved, the neglected, the poor, the sick, and the weak, if you're afraid of a woman who will relentlessly stand upon the American secular values of truth, justice, liberty, equality, inclusion, tolerance, and religious freedom for everyone, then the answer to your question of whether I'm the most dangerous woman in Tennessee is, you bet your sweet ass I am. Thank you. And if I did this right, we have a time for a question or two? Yes, we have about five minutes. Okay, sweet. Chris. What did the vote count turn out? What's that? What was the vote count? Uh, it was about it was about 35. But actually, it was it was a it was a percentage point higher than I did in 2016, which is about 36 percent, 36 to his whatever 64. See, hand back here. I'm going to sprint. It's a good thing I'm athletic. <laughs> Sorry. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you for what you did. Sure. Um, is there anything that you could have done looking back to maybe have um, stopped or anything that you would have done different that could have maybe put you over the edge to win, that you could have done to stop the way they were able to get um, the churches to advocate for the other side? Like Wonderful in reflection. question. Outstanding question. Um, when, when we made the decision to run, there was no question that I wasn't going to hide the atheism. I wasn't going to run on it, but I wasn't going to hide it. If I had to do it all over again, I probably run on it a little harder because it is my non-belief that motivates me. I, I, I said this all throughout the campaign and I wish I had driven it home a little further. We as non-believers, we don't use a rule-based morality. We don't use a book-based morality. We use a people-centered, we have access to a people-centered morality. And if I had said that, I, I think if I had the, to do it all over again, I might say that even stronger. I might say it is because of my secularism. It is because I don't think anybody's going to come save us or that there's a master plan that drives me to do good. Thank you. 
Will I run again? I have not closed the door to that. Don't know when, don't know where, but I certainly have not ruled that out. Thank you for that question. Thank you, lady, for your hard work. My name's Carlita Sims. I used to be Tennessee State Director, American Atheist. I know how you feel, but I was blatant like you, and I had temporarily contemplated some office. I was beaten down, but I did get lots of support for all my activism with the legislature. Um, the, I actually was in Associated Press International, so I hope to have, by doing that, accomplished a lot of communication with other atheists out there. Um, I hope you run again, and I guess my question is, do you, and let me know if I can help you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman who asked the first question, Chris, he and I were having a conversation yesterday, and I said, one of the things we need to prepare for, and I've already mentioned this, the results of the election are binary, and I get it, and our objective is to get those seats. We have got to do a little something about the shit show that's our government. Having said that, oh, see what happens when you cuss? <laughs> Having said that, if we can accept the fact that there, we have all of these secondary goals and all of these secondary reasons for running, and then we run, we, we hope for the best, we prepare for the worst, we brace ourselves, you have automatic elevation. You're automatically in the spotlight when you run and you're already out. It gives you a platform. All of this work of telling every, these, I met in, I met ladies' church groups in their basement church ladies. Now, these are mostly Democrats, but nonetheless, these are church ladies that would have me come talk to them. This is the, this is really the first encounter they've had with a non-believer. And as I would talk through it and explain exactly what I explained to you, you could, you could almost feel the progress. And as I said, we got the Democrats to go along with it. It wasn't as big an issue for them. But as we run for office, and as I encourage other non-believers to run for office, my, my advice is, it's okay. Getting the seat is only the first goal. Just a quick question. Is there any way you could have any legal support if Republicans were to do, or is that something underway after the result of them mostly, that's a, like that, using religion? Yes, that's also a good question. When the whole thing was going down and, and the letter went out to the churches, think about what happened there. The campaign manager... Maybe he's in a gray area of whether, probably what he did was unethical but not unconstitutional. We, we, we know that you don't have to remove religion completely from your life when you run for office. Neither do you have to remove your atheism. It, it informs your uh, life view. So it was, it was probably just unethical for the campaign managers to send that letter. But think about the power of that letter to those pastors. It was coming from what was going to likely be their state senator. And then the pastors turn around and preach. And these are rural Tennessee churches. Some of these pastors may have known. Some of them probably didn't know. So he let them, he let them lean into this unconstitutional behavior. So who was in the wrong here? Who was it that initiated the bad behavior? So, but in the middle of it, because we didn't have the money to poll. The other side was polling, and of course, of course there's somebody who's gonna come tell us what the poll results, results are, because that just happens. So we didn't have the money for polling. We were, we were gaining so steadily that when they sent the letter, we talked about it. We reached out to American Atheists, we talked to FFRF, we talked to American Humanists. Should we do something about this? Should we? And we thought coming in with the force of the whole secular movement, when we still had the opportunity to maybe pull off the election, we made the decision then we were, going to, we were just going to continue to work around what it was. Ultimately, would I have done it differently? Probably not. But uh, that, that would have been something we could have availed ourselves of. I'm sure I'm out of time. Thank you all so much. Oh, I'm OK? Oh. Any other questions? I think I'm filling the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi. I just want to say, first of all, thanks for the inspiration. And. Um, did you get any pushback from the Democratic uh, religious community in Tennessee? I know it's not big, but did you get, and the primary particularly, and how did you deal with it? That's, a, that's um, when, I, when I first made the decision to run in 2016, as I said, it was a little five-county district. I felt an obligation to those 
Democratic parties of those five counties, that's our structure in Tennessee as county, before I made the decision, before I asked those parties, and the party is where your main support comes from, before I did that, I went to each one of the five parties, and in their party meeting, not the general public meeting, but in their party meeting, I sat down with them and I told my story. I told my story about being a religious person for the first 40 five years of my life. I told my story about my four children when they became teenagers began asking me questions that I couldn't answer and how together they led the way and we came out of religion. They needed to know that story because they needed to have some kind of understanding of who I was and what it, where I came from. So I did that out of an obligation. I got no resistance whatsoever from the Democratic Party. I did tell you this thing. I, I met with the ten, at the Tennessee state level, I met with them before I ran in 2016 and nobody knew who I was. And I was meeting with one of the, the deputy political director, whatever. And I told him I was interested in this state Senate seat in this, so this district. And I said, but I have some news for you that you may not like. I said, what? What might be the worst thing of all the good things I have? What might be the worst thing? And he said, are you an abortion doctor? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm an atheist. <laughs> he said, same difference. So, <laughs> so different folks had different reactions, but I, I, got, I got almost zero pushback from the Christian Democrats in my district. All right, we got time for one, maybe two one more. Hi, um, I didn't realize this, but I am now a very big fan, and I oh. want to be you when I grow up. Um, but uh, my question is, for people who have considered running but have no experience or want to get in on the ground floor of actually uh, making a push for those seats, running for those seats, what are oh, some good first steps? Um, what a great question. I'm not a political operative, so take this you know, with a grain of salt. I would think that the first step, uh, you know, it really does make sense to kind of start at the bottom and work your way up. You build momentum. There's a young man here, we talked about his township seat. Starting at the bottom, Getting your name out there, maybe even coming up, even if it's school board, coming up with a little tiny piece of legislation that you can build your, you know, build so that the next time when you go for the next up. However, I didn't do that. I jumped right into state senate, which, you know, you got school board and city council and county commission and a bunch of options before you get to that level. I would encourage you to do that. And in addition to that, I would encourage you to attach to a campaign first. If you can see firsthand the um, all of the different moving parts that are required in a campaign, that is, can be nothing but helpful. And it, it gets you, you kind of meet the movers and the shakers, and that's real helpful. So I would just say those kinds of things. There's people that have much better advice than I do about that question. Are we? Give it up for Gail Jordan. Sweet. 